Morning everybody, thanks very much for coming. Um, today I'd like to introduce Dr. Sean Wilkinson uh, from Victoria University in Wellington. He's actually a fairly uh, long-term collaborator uh, with me from Timor. Um, he did his PhD in coral genetics and biodiversity. Um, and actually I met him when he was doing a postdoc in Timor on a similar, similar thing, reef genetics in, in Timor, developing methods around that. Um, but the reason why we, I'm not, you know, device, diversifying into coral genetics, he's actually an expert R coder as well. So I sought his advice on, on developing the data pipeline that you may have seen through the Inspire Challenge uh, project. So he helped me write the code that, that basically is the glue that puts all those different applications together. Um, since meeting him, I've been trying to convince him that fisheries is a far better application of his talent, but that battle continues. Um, so please help me in welcoming him, and uh, we look forward to hearing what he's got to say about eDNA. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for hosting me here at uh, World Fish Headquarters in the uh, culinarily delightful Penang. It's great to be here. Uh, my name is Sean Wilkinson, and uh, I um, am a, a research fellow and teaching instructor and um, bioinformatics consultant at Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand. And uh, I um, am here at the uh, behest of Alex, Alex Tilly, who's uh, got me working on uh, this Inspire Challenge project, um, creating a digital pipeline for um, small-scale fisheries data in Timor-Leste. Uh, but I'm sure you've already heard enough about that from Alex, so I'm not going to be talking about that today. Uh, we'll be um, talking a bit about um, Biomonitoring with environmental DNA. So, monitoring biological changes uh, lies at the heart of ecosystem conservation and management and restoration. Um, before we really do anything, we need to uh, know a bit about what's there, so initial baseline biodiversity surveys. Um, and it's also very important to get um, accurate, uh, reliable information on species distributions, um, species uh, ranges and population sizes. It's also very important to monitor um, things like invasive species and uh, uh, the spread of parasites and um, uh, other, other problematic taxa, um, in, uh, especially in situations where um, an early intervention um, may help to um, appease any problems that may be caused by them down the track. Uh, it's also important to monitor the impacts of, um, uh, caused by human development and um, things like measuring declines in biodiversity associated with human projects and loss of ecosystem function which may arise from local um, development projects or, or worldwide anthropogenic um, stresses. So early detection um, of ecological changes um, can lead to timely interventions and um, we can also use biomonitoring to measure the success of those interventions. So until recently, relatively recently, um, biomonitoring was predominantly done visually. Um, and so it would either be done by divers, um, scuba or s on snorkel, or by taking water samples and, and analysing uh, what, what's in the water samples under a microscope. And they tended to be based on, especially water sampling, uh, water sample monitoring tended to be based on um, a few, a handful of bioindicator species, uh, often things like uh, macroinvertebrates, um, things like stoneflies and mayflies are, are popular bioindicator species, but there's really um, a shortage of robust sort of evidence that um, they work. <laughs> so, you know, um, you, you may find mayflies and stoneflies in, in a um, pristine habitat, uh, but also find them in a um, degraded habitat as well. So. Um, using, using a few sort of uh, easy to spot bioindicator species is sort of fraught with problems. Um, it can also be very costly and time consuming, particularly where divers are involved, and um, can be quite difficult as well. So um, things like phenotypic plasticity, so the same species but having very different morphologies at, at, um, under different environmental conditions um, can really um, confound um, biomonitoring based on visual surveys. And um, morphological similarities in juveniles as well um, can be very difficult to, to tease apart. Uh, 
also, um, biomonitoring, uh, well, some forms of biomonitoring can be um, invasive and destructive. So you may have um, things like gill netting or electrofishing and things like that that are, um, can, can have a, an impact on the species that you're actually trying to monitor. So collectively, these, um, these shortcomings of visual surveying um, necessitate new and um, uh, uh, sort of yeah, new techniques around bio, bio monitoring. And uh, in recent years, in the last 10, 15 years, um, we're, we've sort of reached a stage where um, DNA sequencing technology, and in particular high throughput DNA sequencing technology, um, has reached a stage where we can, we can carry out biomonitoring based on DNA uh, for a fraction of the cost and, and effort um, of traditional visual taxonomic surveys. So, environmental DNA or eDNA analysis broadly defined as um, obtaining information on species, populations, and communities by uh, retrieving DNA from environmental sources. And so, DNA from higher organisms uh, persists in the environment um, and can be sampled and extracted and analysed um, from things like scales and skin, um, mucus that's left behind, especially by things like coral that secrete lots of mucus, uh, metabolic waste, so um, urine and feces um, contain a lot of DNA. Uh, decomposing cells, so when organisms die, um, they, they eventually decompose and um, cells will be present in the waterway for um, extended periods of time. And broadcast spawners and things will release um, often copious amounts of gametes or, and or larvae into the, into the water column and they can be detected as well with environmental um, DNA surveying techniques. Um, so, so environmental DNA is loosely distinguished from microbiome analysis, which you also may have heard of, um, in that eDNA sampling is, um, we're, we're looking at dispelled matter. Uh, so um, rather than microbiome analysis, which you're actually picking up individual cells of, of um, bacteria and other microbes. Um, but the two terms, eDNA and microbiome analysis, are often used fairly interchangeably and there's not really a, a strict distinction there. And so... As I mentioned before, the, the um, advances in DNA sequencing technology um, mean that now, whereas it was only probably 10 years ago, and it uh, makes me feel old just thinking about it, we, we used to have to um, take, a, take a water sample or, or what have you, extract the DNA out of it, and then insert the DNA fragments into bacteria, and grow up the bacteria on agar plates, and then pick off little colonies and sequence them all individually. Um, nowadays, we can, in a fraction of the time, um, we can produce um, the same amount of DNA as um, you know, 100 million of those bacterial colonies so, um, in just a few hours um, on one of these machines. Um, so this one here is a, an Illumina MySeq, which is a very popular one. But there's, a, there's a range of different um, DNA sequencing platforms out there now. Um, and in fact, um, a company called Oxford, Oxford Nanopore have recently brought out a little USB um, mass DNA sequencer as well, so that's quite an exciting development too, because that can be used in the field um, to get real-time results. And so, with these advances in DNA sequencing technology, um, it's really prompted a, um, a boon in um, new studies that are, that are using environmental DNA to answer you know, important, um, large-scale ecological and evolutionary questions. Um, and now there's some fantastic opportunities. We're at the stage now for um, sustainable fisheries and aquaculture um, to incorporate some of these technologies um, to, to answer some questions around there as well. So a few examples um, that have been sort of publicised in the media recently of uh, people using environmental DNA. Um, these, uh, these guys are... Um, this just came up in BBC a couple of, couple of days ago. Um, these guys are sampling the, the River Cam in Cambridge um, which uh, has been um, historically known for um, being not a very pleasant place to swim. Um, and um, people that are in contact with the river often develop things like um, uh, swimmer's rash, and um, even if they're ingesting water, they can develop fevers and things like that. So these guys are using um, that little micro-USB sequencer um, on site to try to um, uh, pinpoint those, those pathogens that are causing those um, afflictions. And, uh, and it's uh, quite, a, quite a novel use of the technology because they can actually run the, 
run the water sample through the sequencer and get results in real time as well. So um, that's just come out on the news recently. Um, it's also great for detecting the spread of invasive, spe uh, invasive species, things like cane toads, um, and also pathogens, um, so you can um, look at disease transmission patterns and things like that. Um, this is another good example of uh, a group out of the University of Melbourne who are um, engaging in this uh, large-scale citizen science project um, to map the distribution of platypus throughout Australia um, using environmental DNA and then following that up with visual surveys to try to identify um, platypus individuals. Um, so it's great that they're getting the public involved with that as well. You can also use eDNA for um, establishing baseline diversity of um, reef ecosystems um, and it's it can be used in conjunction with these structures called Autonomous Reef Monitoring Structures, or ARMS. Um, and what these do is, uh, if you deploy them out on the reef and leave them for one, two or three years, um, bring them in, and uh, they're, they're com composed of a uh, stack of sediment plates. And if you scrape all, everything that's settled off those plates and then run a, a high-throughput DNA analysis on that uh, slurry, so you just basically just put it in a whiz, whiz it all up, run it... Uh, DNA sequencing analysis on the slurry, and you can detect all sorts of cryptic species that you would never have picked up if you were doing visual surveys alone. Um, so th these are great tools for um, deep, deep uh, diversity um, analysis for cryptic species. And a team out of uh, the University of Copenhagen just a year or two ago um, managed to identify individuals of um, whale sharks, so uh, using eDNA, or taking water samples from spawning aggregations of whale sharks, they were able to pinpoint exactly which individuals were there um, in that spawning aggregation just by using um, water samples. Um, so that, um, that was an interesting study as well. And then a team out of New Zealand just uh, so this year or last year um, decided they were going to go and sample for the Loch Ness Monster, or so they said. And uh, what they were really doing, it was actually just a very clever um, public communication campaign what they were really doing is um, uh, monitoring, uh, um, establishing the baseline biodiversity of Loch Ness, and um, they sort of brought the Loch Ness monster into it to sort of engage the public. And so, I think it's a good thing to um, for the field and you know to raise awareness out of what what can be done these days and and raise awareness to, um, for biodiversity in general and its importance. So, what exactly is involved with um, eDNA sampling and analysis? It's actually not that difficult, although it can be a little time-consuming. Um, generally, what happens is you go out with some sterile water bottles, um, usually collect somewhere between 8 and 10 um, one-litre bottles per site, um, and you just dunk them under the water around 30 centimetres deep, and uh, filter those water samples um, over uh, using a little gentle peristaltic pump, um, and collect all the little cells and everything that are present in the water on um, filter membranes. So typically you use around a 0.45 micron membrane that picks up individual cells. Then you'd extract the DNA off those membranes just using a, a standard sort of centrifuge DNA extraction kit which are relatively cheap, about $5 per sample. And all they require is a centrifuge and a, a little vortex. And so you can really just set up a, set up a lab in your, in your bathroom if you wanted to, um, which I did. And uh, you can also pre-amplify specific genes of interest. So if you want to um, do a metabar coding analysis, which um, uh, may target a particularly informative uh, gene, for example, the CO1 gene from the mitochondrium, um, you could pre-amplify that gene with a PCR and then run a um, next-generation sequencing analysis on those um, amplified CO1 fragments. The alternative is, is to just load your DNA sequence, uh, your DNA um, extracted samples straight onto the um, next generation sequencer and just sequence everything in there. And that's called shotgun sequencing metagenomics. Um, and while, while that is um, useful for picking up bacteria, um, it's the, the sort of the vast majority um, within the water is bacteria. So it really only picks up bacteria or, or small microbes. And you, you only get, you may sequence 10 million sequences and you get three or four that belong to a metazoan or an animal or, or, or what have you. So, um, so there's various different techniques where you can target certain taxonomic groups um, or you can just do a shotgun sequence and, and just sequence everything that's in the water. All of it though requires not, not a whole lot of, of setup, 
and um, can be deployed fairly remotely. This was just in my bathroom in Timor. And so what happens next is that the, the high throughput sequencer, and there's a, there's a few different uh, platforms, uh, but they all sort of run on relatively the same sort of uh, um, technology, so that they are um, measuring the, the flow of DNA across a membrane or through a, through a little pore, and um, for each base, for each A or C or T or G, it'll give off a little um, electrochemical signal, um, which there'll be very precise little instruments within the the next generation sequencer that will pick up those signals and translate them into a DNA sequence, so a, a string of A's and C's and T's and G's, and that'll be uploaded to a, to a disk. Uh, and typically, like a, um, uh, an, an eDNA run will, will generate one or two gigabytes worth of um, these sequences. From there, the sequences are generally fed into what's called a bioinformatics pipeline, and that's um, just a fancy way of saying a bunch of computer programs, each of which do a, a sort of a separate task, um, whether it be um, quality filtering of the DNA, um, assembling short reads into larger, longer reads called contigs, uh, or um, predicting the source organism for each um, DNA sequence, um, or, or downstream analysis, um, things like diversity estimation and abundance. Um, and the effects of intervention activity, etc. So this all sounds fantastic and has led some to ask, you know, what's the point of doing visual surveys anymore if you can just take a sample of water and um, sequence everything that's in it? Um, and it's, um, it's, you know, a reasonable question. Uh, you know, you can get fast real-time results on site now with those um, little USB sequences. Um, you can save a fortune in time and money um, if you don't have to employ... Um, taxonomic experts and get them uh, get them to your site and um, I know they can be difficult to track down at the best of times um, and it's also um, great for hazard mitigation as well so um, any situation where you don't have to have divers in the water um, it's got to be a good thing especially in places like Timor which is uh, teeming with you know huge saltwater crocodiles so um, so there's definitely a lot of advantages to biomonitoring with environmental DNA uh, but it's important to remember that it still relies on a, on a foundation of taxonomic expertise. Um, and, uh, for example, um, DNA, uh, environmental DNA, must be mapped back to a reference database um, containing sequences that had been deposited there originally by taxonomic experts um, in, in order for us to make inference about what, what species or genus they might have come from. And those databases are still woefully um, undercovered and um, there's the teeming with problems. Um, people have put in... Um, sequences and attributed them to a species when it's actually another species or another family or, or order or anything. Um, so there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of problems in there and a lot of the species that have been deposited in those databases um, don't have vouchered specimens in the museum associated with them so we can't go back and, and double check. Um, we just sort of have to trust that what's in there is right. Um, and so to take environmental DNA monitoring to the next le level is going to require a big effort by taxon experts to clean up those databases and, and um, curate them so that the results of environmental DNA analysis are going to be more robust. Also, an emerging field in um, biodiscovery is, is um, discovering new species using environmental DNA. So using unsupervised machine learning, um, you can take a DNA data set and find a cluster of sequences that have no known um, species associated with them in the reference databases and go, OK, well, that perhaps that represents a new species, new to science. And so... Um, we can then use the eDNA to guide us to go and find find the species and then um, describe it. But again, that requires um, taxon experts to do the morphological analysis and um, describe the, the biology of the species and the trophic level, and, uh, etc. Um, so I can't under, understate the importance of taxon experts um, even more so now um, in this age of eDNA sequencing technology. Um, and this is at a time when, unfortunately, a lot of taxon experts are being laid off. Um, New Zealand, we, we, we've just laid off two um, international um, experts um, from our national museum. And it's um, kind of sad, really, because we, um, we really need those guys to, um, to carry on with these eDNA um, analyses. Um, and so I guess, I guess my take-home point is that it's, um, uh, we, we're kind of not at the stage where we can really transfer to just eDNA surveys. We need to be sensible about it, be sensible about it and um, um, at least now, 
uh, be, be thinking about how we can combine the two and how they can complement each other. So aside from what I just mentioned, there's a few other um, limitations of vDNA that can be uh, uh, worthwhile talking about. Um, because if you're going to go and design a new eDNA survey, you really need to be aware of just what, what the limitations are. Um, and as I mentioned, there's, there's issues with the reference databases. Um, and there's also issues with abundance estimation. So while we can generally um, be fairly confident in our, in our results in a presence-absence context, um, looking at abundance with eDNA is still a field that um, has got a lot of work to be done on it. Uh, and that's due to things like uh, you see very, very high between replicate variation. So if you, if you go to a site and take 10 bottles of water, um, you'll see vastly different community compositions with the, within each of those 10 um, bottles of water often. Um, and uh, so it's difficult to, to really um, come up with a robust abundance estimate when you've got so much variation between replicates. Um, there's also a problem with multi-copy genes. So uh, the CO1 marker, which is a very popular metazoan barcode marker, um, occurs in multiple copies in, uh, within each cell, and those copies can change um, according to cell type or just, just naturally between cells. And so just because you're picking up 10,000 copies of, a, of one sequence of CO1 from a certain species of fish doesn't necessarily translate into the abundance of that fish in the system. You could have just picked up one cell with 10,000 know, copies of that, of that gene in it. So we're still a long way away from, well, I think we're still a long way away from uh, being able to produce robust abundance estimates from eDNA. Um, and it's also, it's difficult to distinguish the source material origins as well of eDNA samples. So um, there's no way of knowing whether your DNA sequence came from a larva or a decomposing cell or a, um, some, some flesh or mucus or something like that. And each of those will degrade at different rates. And so difficult to, um, to, to estimate the abundance uh, based on that as well. Uh, there's also things like taxon biases to be aware of, so um, especially in situations where if you're pre-amplifying a gene, a marker gene um, with PCR, the, the um, primers that you use to amplify that gene will often pick up some species over others, so be, be biased towards some, some taxa. And so um, just because you don't see um, a certain organism in your sample doesn't mean it's not there, it just, just could have been... Um, a result of taxon bias due to the primers or um, uh, things like reproductive spikes. So certain species reproduce more at certain times a year and so you, um, because you're picking up a bunch of one species, it could just be because it's reproducing and none of the other species in the vicinity are and you're just picking up a bunch of gametes or larvae. Also, um, the uneven database coverage, uh, reference database coverage is a bit of a problem as well. So, for example, that CO1 gene, um, there's been a huge worldwide effort to sequence the CO1 of um, all the insects in the world. And so the reference database tends to be chock full of insects and be underrepresented in terms of marine invertebrates. Um, so when you, when you go to try to identify the source organism of a piece of marine um, environmental DNA, you often come back with an insect. And that's just because there's so many more insects in the database. Um, so that's a problem as well. Things like contamination is also an issue, especially when you're using PCR to preamplify genes of interest. Um, and there's still no real universally accepted method of dealing with contamination in environmental surveys, uh, DNA surveys. Um, and people usually tend to just sort of explain it away when they're writing publications on it. Um, but it's, I, I view it as still, a, still a, an unresolved issue. Um, and especially when you're when you're setting up a lab in your bathroom, you tend to get a lot of human DNA contamination in there as well. Um, high rates of base calling errors. So I mean, um, some platforms, um, more so than others, it's a problem. Um, but when it's trying to translate those electrochemical signals into A's and C's and T's and G's, quite often they get it wrong. And so with a G, they'll, they'll claim it's a T, and, and et cetera. And some platforms are more um, prone to it than others. So that little USB one, uh, the nanopore, um, that's the main, main sort of thing holding that back is that it's, um, the accuracy is just not up to the standard of those other, other platforms. Um, in some cases, the accuracy is not that important, but um, uh, certainly for barcoding, DNA barcoding and things, you want to you have exact reads. You don't want to have any mistakes in those reads. 
and there's new algorithms coming out now, new machine learning algorithms, one called Data2, which um, is uh, designed to um, detect those um, errors, those base calling errors, um, and resolve them during the bioinformatics um, pipeline stage. Um, another thing which is very close to my heart is um, you tend to get very high false discovery rates um, when you're assigning uh, eDNA sequences to taxa. And so um, there's various algorithms out there that take an eDNA sequence using a reference database and say, this belongs to this species or, or this genus. Um, and unfortunately, the false discovery rates that you get from those algorithms are, are vastly higher than what would be considered acceptable in any other branch of biology. Um, and some of the testing that I've been doing recently, um, I've seen false discovery rates um, at the species level of up to 70%. Um, so when you consider 5% is usually the, the level that we're comfortable with, 70% um, is kind of disturbing, really, and even sort of 30% at genus level. Um, so there's still a lot of work to be done there. And that brings me to um, one of the things that I've been working on recently is developing a new algorithm um, to map eDNA sequences back to um, the original species via a reference database um, using supervised machine learning. And so the reference database consists of species, um, so sequences obtained from individuals, organisms of species. Um, and so we know where they came from. And so we can uh, use them to assign species origin or genus to environmental DNA. These databases are generally publicly available, and GeneBank is, is the most um, recognisable example, but there's a few others. Um, but the vast majority, at least in my experience, of doing environmental DNA analysis, the vast majority of those sequences that you pick up don't appear um, in the reference database. And so depending on the, the marker, if you're using a barcode approach, um, so amplifying a specific marker, um, you can get anywhere, less than 1% of your sequences will appear in that um, reference database. Um, so admittedly, a lot of those other ones will be PCR um, sequencing errors and things like that, but I think there's a huge amount of undescribed diversity out there um, that haven't been deposited in the, the reference databases yet. So the challenge is to uh, predict the origin of each eDNA sequence um, down to the lowest taxonomic rank possible. And while that not, may, may not be species level, um, it's still useful if we can assign a family to it or an order. Um, and so I developed this algorithm called INSECT, short for in Informatic Sequence Classification Trees. And what it does is it um, uses a process of elimination by asking a series of questions. So for each sequence that goes into it, it'll ask a series of questions like, does it belong to a plant? And if not, is it an animal? And if so, is it a, a sponge? Is it a glass sponge, blah, 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 all the way down the tree of life um, until it reaches um, as far as it can go um, and then stops there and then returns the taxon that it stopped, um, that is associated with the node that it stopped um, on in the tree. Uh, so, so it uses a process of elimination, kind of similar to the board game Guess Who, I guess, in a way. Um, some of you may be familiar with it. It's a process of elimination game. But rather than asking questions like, do you have red hair and do you have a hat and things like that, um, it uses, um, the algorithm uses information theory um, and a special um, type of model called a profile hidden Markov model, um, which sound, sound complicated, um, and, and they are. They are complicated. But they, uh, they can be used to probabilistically um, ask questions about DNA sequences and assign them to, to categories. Um, and so... Because it uses full probabilistic models, and, and by that I mean um, not a heuristic approach, um, which just sort of um, is a fast but may not be guaranteed to find the optimal solution, um, this algorithm it uses full probabilistic models, and it's a lot slower, admittedly, um, than the, the other algorithms that are out there. But um, I tend to find that it's much more accurate, um, and we can reduce those false discovery rates down a bit. Um, so here are some of the benchmarking results that I've been um, getting from it. This is the CO1 marker. Um, and so insects are one in the red, and you tend to get lower, lower false discovery rates at the genus level. Um, and uh, you can tweak the, the sensitivity. And so I, I ran this analysis um, so that they would, all of the algorithms would give approximately similar false discovery rates. Uh, but what that means is that um, the, the sensitivity or the recall 
is the number of or the percentage of reads that can be assigned um, is is different. So so this algorithm, while while keeping the false discovery rate constant, um, produced far more accurate, uh, far more um, correct ass assignments um, across all levels. So, so well, except except the the kingdom level, but the phylum uh, class order family levels, we, we, we got far more out of our data um, rather than uh, the other sort of uh, heuristic based algorithms that are out there. So I've shown great promise. Um, I guess, so what I'm trying to explain here, I'm not doing a very good job of it, but um, you could also try to keep the sensitivity the same, so get, get um, the same number of assignments and then test the the false discovery rate, and so uh, I haven't got the data here, but um, the insect algorithm, the false discovery rates were much lower when the recall rates were kept constant. So it's a, it's a kind of like a, um, a pair of scissors. So you've got um, since the recall on one one blade, and false discovery or precision on the other, and you can kind of tweak one, and then the other. If you try to improve one, the other will um, degrade, and, and vice versa. So. Um, yeah, so in this case, the sensitivity, um, the number of reads that were correctly assigned were much greater using the insect algorithm. Um, and I think that's about, I mean, I'm confused now, so I'm, I'm not sure how you guys are going, but uh, I think that'll, that'll probably be a wrap. <laughs> Might be lunchtime too. So um, I hope, hope you all enjoyed a uh, little chat about eDNA, and uh, please feel free to ask me any questions, and I'll do my best to answer them.